Ahora lo vamos a hacer todo en español, se acabó. No, no. Um, so, yes, um, we're about to start. I have an, an important announcement to make. Uh, we've changed the program slightly. Uh, Daniel Wilcott is not going to be here, but so uh, Sandy Grandi ha uh, has uh, graciously uh, agreed to speak uh, tomorrow at 9 o'clock. So we're, we're starting the program tomorrow at 9 o'clock as planned. Sandy Grandi will speak. After that, uh, also, again, generous move, Eduardo Mendieta will be speaking after that. Besides that, the program is the same, of course, because Eduardo Mendieta will be speaking tomorrow uh, at 10.30. On Sunday, the program will start at 10.30, not at 9. So, so tomorrow is at 9 o'clock. On Sunday is at 10.30 that we start. And there, there are, we have new programs that are being printed out right now, so in a couple of minutes we'll have the new programs here, and uh, there will be also uh, emails coming out, going out informing everyone of this. So I remove myself quickly now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rocio Zambrana. I'm assistant professor of philosophy here at the University of Oregon. Hmm? Okay. So, Rocio Zambrana, assistant professor here in philosophy. And it is really a great honor to be here, part of this conference. I'd like to thank Alejandro for not only organizing this conference, but really staging this dialogue, which is, I think, a really important and um, um, event. It is a truly my pleasure to introduce um, Dr. Nelson Maldonado Torres, who is professor of um, comparative literature at Rutgers University. He received his PhD in religious studies from Brown University and his BA in philosophy from the University of Puerto Rico. And I can't help myself from saying how um, how uh, rare this occasion is to be sharing, um, uh, uh, being part of a conference in which three people on the, on the panel or the um, uh, conference schedule are graduates from the University of Puerto Rico with philosophy BAs, um, uh, Jeffrey Tapas, um, 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 Nelson Maldonado Torres, and myself. <laughs> so, so he is the author of Against War, Views from the Underside of Modernity from Duke University Press 2008, and numerous articles on decolonization and post-continental philosophy. Um, he is currently writing a book entitled Fanonian um, Meditations, which he describes um, as aiming to spell out the epistemological basis of ethnic studies and related issues um, and examines the relevance of decolonization at the epistemological, ethical, and political levels. In the book, he is also particularly interested in the um, crossings of different genealogies of thinking and their appearance in different genres of writing, discourses, artistic expressions and social movements. Um, Dr. Maldonado Torres is currently presiding the Caribbean Philosophical Association and working with a number of colleagues on an initiative to create a Latino and Latina Academy of Arts and Sciences. So please welcome um, me, uh, uh, help join me in welcoming, <laughs> in welcoming Dr. Maldonado Torres who will be speaking today on uh, decolonial ethics and phenomenal meditations for the 21st century. Thanks, Rocio, uh, for the introduction, and thanks to Alejandro and everyone who helped in organizing the conference for hosting us here for the kind invitation for me to join this wonderful group. Um, and also I want to say, before I forget, that the reference to the 21st century uh, in the title, in a way, um, alludes to the, to the changes that are occurring, uh, in a way, globally, uh, with the increase of this disproportion between uh, the 
the top 10 and the, and, the, and the 10 in the bottom lines of, you know, in terms of accumulation of riches and poverty, uh, but also in the case of the United States, the massive demographic change that is taking place uh, in the states where it is anticipated that for the first time since the United States is the United States as, as a constituted bo political body, um, um, Anglo-Saxon whites will no longer be the majority. And I think that uh, when in the future, future centuries, if we are still around, people look to the 21st century and they look to the United States, this is going to be one of the main features that they, were, they are going to say about this country uh, in the 21st century, that change and whatever happened or failed to happen because of it. So when I talked about decolonial ethics and family meditations, those are uh, the kind of things that I have in mind as relevant, that this discourse can still be relevant for these kind of topics, which I think are actually very much linked to the legacies of colonization and decolonization that we have seen for the last 500 years. Uh, also, I want to say that I am, I had the privilege, the enormous privilege of being a student of Dr. Enrique Duceo um, uh, in, in Mexico, and that in a way I participate with him in some of his particularities, uh, particularly like the blackboard or the notebook here. <laughs> and I, I, I was going to say, he's, he's lying when he's saying that he just needs it because, you know, he's talking in English and he needs it as a supplement. He were in, in Mexico right now talking in Spanish. He will have even more of these here to draw. Uh, so here I put basically seven points that I'm uh, going to try to cover in my talk. Some of them are very quick. Some of them I will take more time. But I will read through them because I know that not all of you can see them and so that all of you can have an idea of where I am in, in, uh, as I go through them. Uh, first, ethics in or ethics and the Americas. Second, ethics in the global north. Three, coloniality and decolonization. Fourth, Fanon and liberation philosophy. Five, coloniality, race and gender. Six, the idea of Latin America and the damnation of the Caribbean. And seven, thinking from the Caribbean, Fanonian meditations and decolonial ethics and politics. Uh, and we can add to that within the decolonial turn, that is at another concept that I'm going to touch very briefly. And again, it's going to be mainly a survey of a number of themes because uh, uh, this is mainly a, a conversation. So the idea is to open up some points to see which ones are of interest and we can continue with them. So first, um, ethics in the Americas. And I want to touch on that question because this is a conference about ethics in the Americas. So uh, the first question is, what do they have to do with each other in any case? Or is ethics and the Americas as related as, I don't know, any any term and the Americas, any given term that you may want to put, or is there kind of a special relationship with ethics that we can think of? And, and I think that there is, because in a way, uh, and th there is if you think of uh, as the Americas, as this new world that in a way was inaugurated through a quite, uh, quite radical suspension of ethics. In a way, the emergence the new world represented to a number of European of old world subjectivities, the suspension of norms that operated in the old world. So new world meant uh, a number of a new reality that emerged, new flora, new fauna, and the number of uh, new beings around that they couldn't even know if they were going to classify them as full human beings or not. And so like, the new world, and this actually... Um, um, uh, Todorov has a, a, and I have a number of issues with his work, but in this particular point, I find it particularly illustrative, which is when he says, well, what is the difference between, let's say, um, the Aztecs, what the Aztecs did with the, you know, sacrifice and killing, and what the Spaniards did, what the Spaniards did with the, with the massive uh, genocide. And they said, well, the Aztecs belong to a society where they could have legitimized sacrifice, human sacrifice. What happened in the conquest and colonization, that shift from the old to the new world and what the new world represented was the opening up to a world where you can actually have massacre and not only sacrifice, individual sacrifice in honor of a god because of a specific human being that you sacrifice or an enemy in a war but where actually you can have decimation, genocide, and not even feel too much that you have to account for it. 
And I mean, this will be too long uh, uh, for me to develop, but basically the idea that there is a radical suspension of ethics. The ethics that begin to unfold are in some way death ethics uh, instead of ethics to regulate. And this has to do in a way because of the naturalization of war. Uh, because before, for instance, with the slavery and some kinds of killing, you could do it within a justified war. In the Americas, what begins to happen is that now you don't have necessarily to produce too many justifications, ultimately, for killing uh, someone else, because somehow the, the reason for that is inscribed in their bodies due to their inferiority. So in a way, racialization normalizes and naturalizes the ethics of war, which are, wars of, which are, which, which are the death ethics of killing. So the Americas, uh, if we put it in a nutshell, are born in a context of a suspension of ethics. So ethics cannot be more important for the Americas, when one thinks of the Americas. If you want, you can also think about, in terms of that new subjectivity, that new uh, uh, self that is identified in the Americas, this sort of non-completely human, semi-animal, sort of animal without soul, you know, you don't know how to qualify it, that kind of being the indigenous, and then gradually the uh, black subjectivities, that uh, black groups that were brought and qualified no longer as African or as Arabs, but as blacks. And that being negro or being negra meant it was a category of damnation, meaning that you can unleash uh, any kind of treatment without necessarily having to account for it in any even kind of law, because these subjects did not fit in, would not belong to the realm of law. So the Americas is crucial for that kind of new uh, positionality, ideology, culture that opens up. So again, if there is something that we should th be thinking about in the Americas, it is precisely this question of the ethical and I think the political as well. Uh, the opposite of naturalized war, the opposite of this, you could say, is peace. The opposite of war is peace. Right? But in a way, you know that if you have a world where it is unleashed in multiple forms of, of naturalizing war, of naturalizing violence, of justifying it, uh, actually not having to justify it because you consider it as a natural kind of uh, behavior that you should demonstrate towards uh, particular bodies, uh, you realize that calling for peace is not just good enough. You have, to, you have to develop kind of actions and discourses that can actually counteract th that new world that emerged and can, and can try to create another world. And that is actually what we're going to, how I'm going to see the notion of decolonization as the undoing of that uh, context of naturalized world, uh, war and the redoing of something um, uh, new. But this means that, uh, again, this kind of action that you need to do, to engage in, has to do with uh, not only the cessation of violence, but an actual proactive form of ethics and politics that can redo, undo, and redo. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two is a point about ethics in the global north. Now, not, let's not think about the Americas. Let's think about ethical discourse today. And this is, I mean, ethical discourse today is, is going in, I mean, there are many sources, many discussions out there. I want to focus on one particular kind of, of um, ethical discourse. And it's the one connected with uh, Levinas and uh, the response of Levinas and Levinas' scholarship, in part because uh, where I am going, the philosophy of liberation, for instance, that thought about from the Americas, from Latin America, and about ethical and political issues, it talked direct inspiration from Levinas, as we heard this morning from Dussel. So I thought that we'll revisit a little bit of, of Levinas, talking about, and I'm going to read a little bit fast, but uh, here I just want you to pick at least a couple of the points for you to uh, uh, a couple of examples for you to understand the, the main point. It's not necessary for you to understand every single point that I'm going to, or quote that I'm going to read, but th what I'm after is the following. First, the identification of a form of hegemonic identity politics uh, in, in Levinas' work and his view of the non-European other, and I'm going to give some examples of that. Uh, the hegemonic identity politics in contemporary political theory and, and the understanding of what is radical, radicality, radical thinking or radical political theory as something that involves necessarily a critique of minority identity politics and multiculturalism. And for instance, Badiou and Shishek. Uh, and then the influence uh, of that view against uh, uh, 
feminism, against discourses of difference, against identity politics, uh, influencing Cohen Levinasian scholarship. This is actually a paper that I just finished for a, 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 the next uh, release of the, this book that is part of Levinas Studies, the Levinas Studies series. So this will be coming out uh, next year. John Dravinsky is uh, editing it. Uh, and the conclusion is that hegemonic identity politics in contemporary continental ethical and political theory is, is a norm, is a norm. And actually the fact when I, tr I, I, I go through the examples of Levinas talking about these non-European others, and this is the philosopher of alterity that came to save the construction and postmodernism from ethical embarrassment. Uh, so this is, you know, you are going to listen to him talking about these European others. But I want to mention that in part I am doing this because it's also part of the argument that I have had with uh, Enrique Dussel for a little bit. I told him that he and he, some of people in his generation, they went to Levinas when they should have gone, they went to Europe and to Levinas when they should have gone to places like the Caribbean and more centrally with Fanon. And I'm going to say Fanon was read quickly, mainly Sartre's preface and on violence on Fanon, but, the, but there were massive uh, forms of attention, massive attention reading Levinas and Ricord and all these folks. And I think by what I'm going to point out is that we need, it's not too, too late, and we all need to take that in a way detour um, from Europe to the Caribbean, but also with Europe as well, but not as normative necessarily. So this is Levinas. Uh, in the 1960, he publishes an essay, uh, it's, called, it's entitled The Russo-Chinese Debate and the Dialectic. Uh, and there, uh, in this essay, Levinas voices concern over Russia's increasing departure from the West and its relationship with China. And this is Levinas. The exclusive community with the Asiatic world itself, a stranger to European history, to which Russia, in spite of all its strategic and tactical denials, has belonged for almost a thousand years. Would this not be disturbing even to a society without classes? Okay. Uh, Levinas elaborates on this view of the disturbing element of the formation of a Russian Chinese community of Russia. Uh, God forbids having a, a more intimate connection with China and departing with the connection, the intimate connection with Europe. He says, the yellow peril, it is not racial, it is a spiritual. It does not involve inferior values, it involves a radical strangeness, a stranger to the weight of its past from where there does not filter any familiar voice or inflection, a lunar or Martian past. Uh, to which uh, one of the commentators writes, it is difficult to imagine any circumstance in which the phrase the yellow peril cannot be racist, let alone in the context set by Levinas that consigns a phantasm of Asia to the moon or another planet, thus figuratively stripping Asians of their humanity. Uh, in a passage more than 20 years later, in 1981, Levinas writes, now focusing not about these other people, but about European philosophy. For me, the, essentially, the essential characteristic of philosophy is a certain, specifically Greek way of thinking and speaking. Philosophy is primarily a question of language, and it is by identifying the subtextual sub language of particular discourses that we can decide whether they are philosophical or not. Philosophy employs a series of terms and concepts such as morphe, usia, nous, logos, or telos, which constitute a specifically Greek lexicon of intelligibility. French and German, and indeed all of Western philosophy, is entirely shot through with this specific language. It is a token of the genius of Greece to have been able to thus deposit its language in the basket of Europe. And of course, you then ask yourself, what about other places? Um, um, in another, and actually, I will tell you what he said ab about on another pl uh, uh, other places. In 1991, he wrote, he said, I often say, although it is a dangerous thing to say publicly, that humanity consists of the Bible and the Greeks. All the rest can be translated. All the rest, all the exotic is dance. And he has another statement about the Palestinians, uh, 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 for example, but I think that you get the, the, the point. Uh, so again, this is Levinas from 1961 to about 1990. Um, 
Now, it is not secret that Levinas's work acquired particular value in the global north as a way to infuse post-structuralism and deconstruction with a seemingly irrefutable ethical character in face of the also irrefutable continued violence, domination, and exploitation that raise questions about the power and reach of post-structuralism and postmodern theses. Initial criticisms about the way in which the turn to ethics could easily come to signify no much more than an evasion of politics gave way to even stronger criticisms that depicted the construction and Levinasian ethics as philosophies that not only failed to critically respond to capitalism, but that actually fomented erroneous discourses and practices. These included multiculturalism, identity politics, a relativism, and the ethics of difference, all of which are said to be grounded on or fomented by the prime value of the relation with another. And what I'm going to point out is that ironically, Levinas, who as you just saw, right, when it came to decolonization, when it came to recognition, to recognize the value of multiculturalism of other cultures, he merely shut away and went back to strong Eurocentrism. Interestingly enough, these uh, political theorists like Badiou, like Shishek, said in a way that Levinas already gave too much to those discourses of multiculturalism and identity politics. And they face Levinas for being responsible of providing a logic to them. And what they want is to even go more radical towards uh, Eurocentrism. Um, leading the charge against Levinas have been uh, post-Marxist post -Marx, post philosophers such as Alain Badiou and Slavoj Zizek, both of whom also oppose the politics of multiculturalism, difference, and identity. And this is also coming part of a French experience against uh, pro-universality, the universality of the citizen, vis-a-vis -vis the particularity of the different ethnic subjects against some that they uh, call negatively communitarianism. Um, so as the translator of Badiou's ethics puts it, Badiou's book does nothing less than evacuate the foundation upon which every deconstructive multicultural or post-colonial ethics is built, the ethical category of alterity. And Badiou is explicit that his target is the very idea of the other, rooted, of course, in Levinas' philosophy. This is Badiou. The truth is that in the context of a system of thought that is both a religious and generally contemporary with the truths of our time, the whole ethical predication based upon recognition of the other should be purely and simply abandoned. On his part, Shishek aims to respond to the burning question of how we are to, and I'm quoting, to reformulate a leftist anti-capitalist political project in our era of global capitalism and as an ideological supplement, liberal democratic multiculturalism. Again, multiculturalism as, a, as one of the demons of the age that needs to be vanquished. Uh, and for him, the main coordinates are not Judaism or alterity, which was the Levinas. And in a way, that's what is at, at, the, at the end. There was uh, still too much of difference in Levinas, too much of recognizing a particular identity. He kept bringing the Jew. Of course, after bringing Judaism, he closed the door so that no, nothing else could com, com, come in. But even this was enough, in a way, for these philosophers. And in a way, they turned back to uh, um, St. Paul. It's a way of letting it be known that we don't even have to open that door necessarily in that way for Europe to reach a, 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 a viable discourse about politics today. And actually opening that door and also emphasizing the questions of alterity and otherness has meant, in a way, uh, investing in this, and they said it with a negative tone, in the constructive discourses, postmodern discourses, and ethics devoid of politics. So for them, the project is to bring a politics that is not grounded on the, on the, on the, on the notion, on any notion of alterity, one, and, that, and, a, and a politics that can rely on European and Christian sources alone. Thus, St. Paul becomes so strong, right, vis-a-vis -vis the, the question of Judaism and Levinas. So it's a very interesting internal, imperial, sort of imperial, and subaltern strife, cultural debate, which is interesting because they are complaining about multiculturalism and identity politics. But when you look at what they are doing, how they are talking about non-Western cultures and how they are talking about each other sources, they are doing precisely that which they think is so vicious in minority identity politics. But they don't talk about it because that's the universal, right? And that's part of the, uh, the setting that I want to highlight for this ethics in the global north right now. And um, part of what I'm suggesting, and I had some other examples of how current Levinasian scholarship, there is a volume called entitled Radicalizing Levinas. And in that volume they say, well, we now want to inaugurate a third stage of Levinas's um, 
thought of Levinas as a scholarship that really engages Levinas with sociopolitical questions. And this is something that we are doing now, in the 2000s. And when you look back again in the 1970s in Latin America, they were already, I mean, they could not wait for the construction, aesthetics, and ethics to come. They had immediately to mobilize uh, Levinas in political matters. But in these genealogies, it is as if this does not exist at all. And so you see the typology and genealogy that they create, and they come now uh, to really radicalize Levinas. But which kind of radicalization it is? It is one kind of radicalization that takes directly from this uh, uh, discourse of political theory, meaning the radical is a turn away from difference, is a turn away from anything non-European, and therefore that's why it's so clear when they say radicalizing Levinas, and they don't mention um, the whole um, debate in Latin America and the whole intellectual production in Latin America, radicalizing Levinas in multiple ways. They don't even mention that. One would think that they are being contradictory, but in truth, they are being consistent because the notion of radicalization that they operate is one that precisely is thoroughly Eurocentric and invested in hegemonic identity politics. And to make the point even more, when you go to the initial chapters of this anthology on radicalizing Levinas, um, the second chapter is precisely an attack on identity politics and feminism through Levinas. So you know what means to radicalize Levinas is to do this. Now, what I suggested here in the con in, the, in this contrast is that I would hope that thinking about ethics in the Americas, in the Americas, with the understanding of the Americas that I put out, um, hopefully we see it as something going directly against this trend. So I think this is space as a space that is opening another debate about ethics and politics away from what is normative, what is becoming normative in continental political theory and critical theory out there. So that, that was my point there. Uh, Third point, coloniality and decolonization. Uh, coming back to America, because I need to qualify how, what kind of ethics and politics is central in the Americas. We need to know more about the Americas. And here is where Aníbal Quijano uh, becomes useful, among, uh, among other uh, parts. Uh, because for him, he has an essay with Emmanuel Wallerstein where they talked about the emergence of a new um, matrix of power, of global power, uh, founded in a way, and this is Quijano who really develops it in the conjunction of capitalism and the idea of race, of uh, the capitalistic mode of production now becoming hegemonic for the first time in history, and this happening in the context of discovery and colonization, and attached to this colonization, capitalism becoming dominant, and as a part of the trio, uh, racialization, a new understanding of human beings, so, sh so that from then on, the category of pagan or Christian or this or that, it begins to diffuse. It's still there, particularly the Christian, but new categories begin to emerge, which are the categories, and I, I, I sometimes still ask this to my students, you know, when you fill out the census, you know, what do you think is the significance that you are not asked to put I am pagan. You know, if you were in the Roman Empire, there is a census, and so on. Possibly you are, you are pagan, or you are, you are Zoroastrian, or you are Jew, or you are, you know, it's basically religious differences that are dominating. Now, you need, you fill out a census today. They said, it's so complicated, right? Hispanic, non-white, or white, Hispanic, and, and then black, and African-American, and you have another kind of plethora of meanings. And that is, speaks to a particular way of, of understanding human diversity and of organizing society. Right. And that world is very much, according to Quijano, has a colonial root. That, that understanding of each other through this kind of ethno-racial terms vis-a-vis -vis the religious terms of the old world uh, gives testimony to a new order of order that was colonial in character. And I indeed, that began to separate peoples according to these new categories, both internal to Europe and also globally. So that it was not only Amer America, the Americas that, that in which this worked. It was not only Indians, blacks, Christianos, whites, and, and so on. They look, because these were the people that uh, draw the first maps of the globe, that then, not necessarily the first one overall, there are, there are debates about that, but the first ones that began to gain rapid distribution over the world, right? They had that consciousness of a globe, and they began by drawing the maps to 
determining how to call, how to think about peoples in the different parts of the map. So this very grammar, this very understanding of human difference that began to emerge in that new world is not only operative in the Americas itself, but becomes the model for the, for the entire world. And so colonization, and Aníbal Quijano calls it coloniality, is not a, simply a, a particular power relation between center and periphery, it's a new model patron de poder, it's like a matrix of power. So if that is the case, then the kind of ethics and the kind of politics that we need to engage in that context, ethics in the Americas, need to take centrally the question of coloniality. And so from there is that I moved to talk about decolonial ethics and decolonial politics, because that qualification is important, particularly, I think, in ethics and for ethics and politics generally in modernity, but particularly in the Americas, because what I just said. Uh, so having established that, then I want to think about th this notion of the colonial ethics and the colonial politics. And actually, these are categories, uh, particularly the notion of the colonial or the ethico political or the colonial ethics as an ethico political uh, moment. Um, this I developed in this book against war. And that's, I already tell you, how is it that I understand war? So that decolonial ethics is something that you unleash against war. But war understood not as a particular event, but as a paradigm. Right? Understanding colonization and the naturalization of war and racism and the naturalization of human inferiority generally grounded in a, in also in the naturalization of war. And so what you mobilize against that is ethics and politics, but not any ethics and politics, but uh, ethics and politics focus on dynamics of decolonization, multiple forms of decolonization, therefore decolonial ethics and politics. As I have developed it, I have drawn from two main sources, and one of them is uh, liberation philosophy, Latin American liberation philosophy, uh, and therefore it is not a strange why then for Latin American liberation philosophy, uh, the initial volumes of philosophy of liberation were about ethics of liberation. Why ethics? When you go through Enrique Dussel's work, for instance, there are not going to be more themes that appears more prominently in his work than the ethical and the political. And part of the reason, I think, again, is because he's trying to think from the Americas in that way. So you think from the Americas, these themes are going to become particularly relevant. It's not going to be necessarily epistemology, although that doesn't mean that you don't care about knowledge or certainty or universality or truth. What it means is that in the order of things, ethics and politics appear more uh, at the order of uh, philosophia prima, or first philosophy, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, epistemology. So uh, the other source is Afro-Caribbean philosophy. Afro-Caribbean philosophy, particularly through the work of Fanon, but not only of Frank Fanon. Now, that uh, I want to uh, make a comment here about, because I'm coming to this, in a way, you, you go to the 70s, you see Enrique Dussel producing these volumes on the ethics of liberation. I am referring to the, the colonial ethics, partly inspired and partly drawing from that ethics, but partly also through the intervention of this Afro-Caribbean thinking, which is the one that I, 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 I told him, you know, it would have been so great if there was suddenly a stop, a serious stop in the Caribbean before, before um, getting to, um, to Europe or European thinkers. And this, uh, I mean, when you think about the, uh, the reception of Fanon in Latin America, and Fanon was very much read in Latin America, right? But you see that the Fanon that was read in Latin America, you have to qualify that immediately. It was mainly the Fanon seen as an Algerian revolutionary from North Africa, right? Writing about violence in the breadshed of the earth. Uh, and because Sartre also it came with the preface from Sartre, that was mainly the predominant Fanon that circulated in Latin America. Now, this is, even though Fanon, his first book was called Black Skin, White Masks, and was about Caribbean societies in the New World, the Fanon that circulated in that context was the Fanon coming from Africa. Um, now, the Fanon of Black Skin, White Masks is, of course, a Fanon that is bringing to the fore questions of anti-black racism and racialization. And so the substantial absence of a ser serious treatment of racialization as such um, in Latin American philosophy, I think in general, including Latin American liberation philosophy, in a way happened through that misopportunity, among other things, 
Of course, in the time, you can think about um, why would you do that, right? And why necessarily people were thinking about revolution against capitalism, and uh, many of them thinking that the question of the black, well, that's something it will get solved in, in some way uh, if, you, if you engage in, in the revolution. So it was not, a, but that is precisely what Fanon and many other Afro-Caribbean thinkers, C.L.R. James, for instance, that uh, wrote to Trotsky, convincing Trotsky the black, the so-called black problem, the black question, cannot be subordinated to the, to, to the socialist revolution. Cannot, right? So many of these Afro-Caribbean intellectuals were going against the, uh, the, the, the trend, and in a way, Latin American philosophers, Latin American thinkers were sort of in another bus. Uh, and thus selectively taking on writings from these Afro-Caribbean philosophers, Levinas being, I mean, Fanon being the main example. Uh, now, we, in a way, um, are able to reconnect the Afro-Caribbean discourse and the Latin American discourse, um, yes, through the themes of liberation that were always in, in, the, in, in, the, in Latin American liberation philosophy, but also the work of Quijano helped here. Because Quijano, in his understanding of coloniality, as I have said, he included uh, racialization as a fundamental element of coloniality. So he will not talk only about capitalism and the, 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 uh, the need to overcome capitalism. He will say, first, talking about capitalism as a single unit of analysis is leaving too much out and breaking away from a package of domination in the modern world and that's a bad analysis. When you see what is unleashed at the global scale, it's not just capitalism. For him, it's this thing that he calls coloniality, and it includes race and racialization at the very heart. So because now, um, this comes in part through uh, uh, Latin America and his reading of Mariategui, for instance, uh, that was trying to understand the dynamics of, of capitalism in, uh, in Peru and with uh, the peasants in Peru and indigenous communities. So there was some notion about this, that, that uh, the dynamics of oppression and liberation were sort of different than other places, and Quijano picks on that. But also there are other two things, the 500th anniversary of the uh, so-called discovery of the Americas um, plays a role. Um, and Quijano begins to write about coloniality as such in the late 1980s, closing to... Um, to the 500 year anniversary, right? Uh, and there were in that time from 1987, even after, from 1987 on, many writings by a number of activists, indigenous, black activists, all across the world, particularly in the Americas, talking about what has been, what has not been properly recognized uh, in the so-called discovery, right? And so there is a consciousness. There is also many Creole elites, many mestizo Latin Americans also begin to produce writings about uh, what, colonization and what the discovery meant. And it's in that context that you find uh, uh, this sort of creative intervention by Quijano, but also you had a similar intervention by Sylvia Winter coming through Jamaica and the United States, an Afro-Caribbean intellectual. So again, in a way, that moment, the 500 years anniversary, leads to more of a convergence between this uh, Latin American uh, tradition and a, an Afro-Caribbean tradition. In a way, Fanon was already waiting for them at the end of that line. Uh, but he was in, he, he inspired particularly the Afro-Caribbean uh, tradition. And the other thing with Quijano is that he was he lived in Puerto Rico, where you cannot be in Puerto Rico two days bef uh, without debating what is colonialism and what is decolonization. You cannot be 24 hours before absorbing it in some way, uh, and even if you live there, or particularly if you live there. So Quijano's notion of coloniality, I think, is not only Latin American. It's partly Caribbean and partly comes because of this thinking about the Americas, right? That then forces him to think, we cannot think about, we cannot do sociology without confronting this global power where questions of race and racialization are key. We cannot. We can deceive ourselves as thinking as we could, but we cannot. And that's something that I'm suggesting that also applies to ethics. Um, now, the, uh, another figure that uh, is important to mention here is Maria Lugones, because Maria Lugones engages uh, uh, Quijano centrally, and she argues that it's not only the category of race that is part of this package of coloniality, it's also the category of gender. Um, she has a very eloquent essay where she enters in a critical conversation with him, trying to combine, in a way, 
uh, Quijano's own coloniality theory with some of the insights of women of color in the United States. Uh, actually coming through testing intersectionality theory and being critical of intersectionality theory. And she sort of in finds in Quijano some elements that help her uh, to overcome some of what she sees at the limits, but at the same time she also finds limits in Quijano's theory. So then she proposes uh, a modified version of coloniality theory bringing these two dimensions. Now, if there is something about um, feminism of women of color in the United States, I think is this typically fundamentally coalitional mode of production, vis-a-vis -vis area focus or nationalistic. So when you see many of the men are talking about, we need to do this Latin American philosophy, or we need to do this you know, Chicano or Latino. When you look at the women, particularly uh, uh, women of color in the United States, many of the things that they did, what, you, know, th you did not see them so much claiming a region, a continent, or a nation, and trying to depict now this is our voice. Ma a lot of the production came through coalitions. And it's not that they also, they did not believe in some vindication of some spaces or some identities, but it's extraordinary the level of, of coalition making. So much so that when you have, you know, Ansaldúa, Ansaldúa was in, in constant debates and dialogue with Africa, African American women and also with Native American women and the like. I mean, so that kind of feminism was, and another aspect in that feminism was um, the spiritual, that we did not talk about this morning, but there was another array, and it, and it was very much connected with indigenous spirituality and um, Afro-Caribbean and African-American spirituality, infusing into that uh, um, feminism. Now, I'm saying this because of the following. I think that, in a way, the Caribbean as such, because of the particularities of the region, is not purely continental. There are some parts that are continental, but other parts are not. It's thoroughly... You know, there is a French Caribbean, there is an Anglophone Caribbean. There are parts of the Caribbean that are substantially black. Uh, and the other parts that are more mixed. Uh, but you see that uh, there it was more difficult in the Caribbean to come up with a discourse, like it happened in Latin America. Unlike, in a way, many of us have inherited still when we speak about Latin America. Which is the, no, we need, this is the, the idea of a Latin American ethos or positionality, continental positionality that we need to unfold or develop, just like the Europeans develop theirs, we as the other of Europe can develop ours. And when you go to the Caribbean, there was less, the, uh, there was less reliance of, on a, a spatial imaginary that saw itself as a starting point to articulate something like that. And I think that ultimately, uh, what that has led w uh, for in Latin American philosophy is that sometimes it is sort of a Sometimes it is or aims to be, it's like a mirror image. It's like the other image, it's like another mirror of continental philosophy. So there is continent, European continental philosophy, and thus my desire is to prove to the continental philosophers that there is another continent where we also have philosophy. So we can have two continental philosophies, or multiple. But the question is to what extent the very spatial imaginary of the continent is in a way, to some extent, an imperial or a colonial production, right? And to some extent, perhaps, in places like the Caribbean that could not assume or take refuge in that notion of a homogeneity of peoples uh, or a space that they could occupy or liberate this great space and ample mountains and horizons and, and when you go to Argentina, you know, all the stories, are, you, you see it in the space, right? In the, in the Caribbean, the main reference is the sea, it's like, no, land stops, and then there is, and we know that there is another island there. So you see, the, 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 sp the spatial is sort of um, uh, makes less possible to devil to invest too heavily in a countercontinental discourse and to explore more something like a coalitional and postcontinental discourse. And I am sort of reading then Lugones and Saldúa, even though both one is coming from Peru and another is coming from Argentina, I am reading them as Caribbean thinkers. Um, now, I'm getting to my minute 40, so, uh, and I only have there, but I, I'll, I'll do a summary of the next. Um, that I think that we can explore this more seriously than in depth. When you begin, when you begin for instance, with a volume um, that Walter Mignolo put together several years ago uh, on the idea of Latin America. Where, so where, what is Latin America? Where does this idea come from and what it stands for? And well, he's here and he can, he can spell out more after I speak, but basically uh, uh, 
if one puts it in a, in a nutshell, is, well, the idea of Latin America is, first of all, a project. It's not a natural space. It's a project. And it's a project of whom and for whom. Mainly, mestizo elites in the region. And it, it was a name, and a name that came from Europe, in effort from France particularly, in an attempt to split the North Anglo-America and that other America of the South, and trying to gain the sympathy of that America because it is, after all, Latin, like we are. Right? So mestizo elites are very much open to the game. They take on it. But then the question is, what does it mean for us then when we speak about Latin America? When we say, well, Latin America is not well represented in departments of philosophy or departments or in the university, whatever, and we want Latin America. But, you know, there is the question of, well, but it's in Latin America. What is Latin America? But if Latin America is this project, how complicit can we be or how critical are we being with that project? And it is that I think that in that context, it is important to generate the question, not only of Latin American philosophy itself, but a critical Latin American philosophy that is critical even of the denomination of Latin America, and that not only does that, but actually opens itself completely less to the dialectic with Europe, as if we're going to prove you that we have a philosophy, and more to let's enter into contact with those other places that were less anxious about the continental, less anxious, uh, less anxious about... Uh, uh, mirroring Europe, and maybe um, they began to develop post-continental ideals. And those are certainly in the Caribbean, and I think also are indigenous, uh, uh, many of the indigenous groups that have an hemispheric point of view of the Americas, vis-a-vis -vis a, a typically continental in the traditional way. Uh, so I think these are challenges that I am launching as much as I am also uh, vindicating the importance of the thought that's coming from Latin America, I think that there are many important challenges that need to be confronted when we generate a discourse and institutionalize something that has to do with that. Uh, now, when you go to the, to the Caribbean, I don't think that there's nothing, I mean, well, it would be more difficult. Maybe Walter has to write that next. Uh, uh, the idea of the Caribbean. I said, well, it's the idea that, because in the case of the idea of Latin America, you found like the French ideologues producing the idea it's a political purpose. But well, when you think about the, the Caribbean, the Caribbean was a name. Um, if it is a project, it is a project of damnation. It's not a project of let's get the friendship of this Latin. Let me, the, let's denominate them Latin. They see themselves as Latin. Therefore, they are more connected with us. And they are a natural barrier against the dominant of Anglo-America. But with the Caribbean, the Caribbean were indigenous groups that were considered to be cannibal. So it was not kind of, let's gain the uh, kind of linkage. It was, no, these are the savages, right? And who lives in the Caribbean? Well, the, the literary character that represented Caribbean peoples was Caliban from Shakespeare the Tempest, who, who is a mix of semi-animal, semi-human, and actually, I think, embodies the conditions of indigenous and African slaves in the region. So when you talk about Caribbean it's not necessarily, you know, well, let's vindicate the Caribbean. It's, it's sort of a different relationship with the idea. It's a different discourse. And, and so I think, that, um, I think that this is particularly important because in Latin American studies, perhaps less in Latin American philosophy, although some, but in Latin American studies, uh, there is the tendency sometimes to bring Caribbean and Latin America together as if there is no problematic, no fundamental... Um, as you, you can bring them together just like that. And actually, what it means in most cases is that you will do 90% of things that have to do with continental Latin America and a few things that have to do with the Caribbean. But even more than the issue of quantity or amount, what worries me is the logic that you don't necessarily, uh, you don't develop the view about the problems, the difference between those two categories, one as a category of damnation and the other as a category of hegemonic identity politics. And that therefore you don't develop a critique towards one and you don't use the help that the Caribbean can bring to criticize the other one. Um, now, interestingly enough, uh, my time is off. It's 44 minutes now. Interestingly enough, um, the last part was the longest. And it was the one where I was going to try to um, give you a feel of at least how I attempt to think if one is going to, for a second, I don't think that this has to, take, to be taken too seriously, um, taken in a post-continental way, thinking from the Caribbean. That is, not take it too seriously, but let's, let, let's try to do it for a second. After a second, you move on 
Because if you get stuck in the question of, of indicating the place, sometimes you end up reproducing the very same problems that were reproducing other places. But if you begin to think, OK, what is to think from the Caribbean? Um, that is the talk that I, I'm going to do when, when uh, Alejandro organizes the second part of this conference three years from now. Uh, and I promise that then I'm going to begin with showing how uh, I think it's like MSSR and Franz Fanon provide a discourse that is actually, it's not simply a chapter in the region. They are as Francophone Caribbean subjects from the colonies. They are engaging what they took to be the main Francophone philosophical framework, namely Descartes. So although actually I can pass you the references if you're interested, because part of what I was going to do was a summary of a couple of articles and then some additions. And in one of the articles, what I do is that I read a short text by a messenger entitled Discourse on Colonialism. Have, do you know it? Discourse on Colonialism? How many of you know it? Discourse on Colonialism. Nice, maybe a little bit less than half, but that's, that's great. Uh, but it is, a, it is a short text. It is actually in size and in structure, not too different from um, Descartes' meditations. And actually, when you know, I began to read it closely, and you see in a way that the, that the discourse on colonialism is in a direct conversation without citing too much Descartes, with Descartes' meditations, uh, with Descartes' discourse, all right? So uh, what you find is both begin with the questions of, on, of deception and self-deception, right? The question is, how do, I avoid being, how do I avoid being deceived? But what meaning does that have in the Caribbean in the middle of the 20th century? What kind of deception he may be referring to? And he looks to Europe and he's talking about the deception of everyone thinking for 500 years that European civilization, this increasing... Uh, uh, ideology that European civilization was the height of human civilization. Uh, what he realizes is that if we have to try to exercise uncertainty and doubt and deception, it is not simply from an evil demon that can deceive us to think that 2 plus 2 is 5 when 2 plus 2 is 4. It's from another kind of evil demon that have made us begin to doubt, particularly in the colonies, even our own humanities, even to that point, that evil demon, and this is what Fanon in Blas King White Mass is after. We have black people in the Caribbean who are among their people to want to cease to be black and to become white. That's one, one of the highest levels of self-deception where you are deceived into thinking you're not human enough. You got to disavow yourself and become something else. So the problem of deception and self-deception in the colonies gets a very particular form where again, it's not the question of epistemology so much that is central, it's something having to do with the subject. And ultimately, it will be a political and an ethical question for which, at the end, I end up advocating for something like decolonization as fair philosophy. But my time is up, and that will be next time. Thank you. So just a quick reminder, we have updated uh, schedules in the back. So when you, you leave, you can pick up one of the updated schedules. Thank you. Um, I have a little question. I come from Guatemala, right? And you know the situation we have uh, there with the <laughs> tremendous uh, structural injustice. And uh, so um, I, I used to work with, um, in an indigenous city in Guatemala. And one thing that, that it, um, was inter very interesting to me, it was that the Indi indigenous people indigenous individuals did, uh, did not feel represented by their um, uh, defenders of ide indigenous identity in the um, uh, mass media, right? Yeah, so my question is the following. Uh, when we talk about um, <coughs> the ethics of the coloniality, uh, those uh, uh, clashes between different identities, uh, Latin America, Europe, and things like that, my question is, where is, in, in what place with, uh, is the ethical, the simple, so to speak, ethical relationship in the sense of Levinas, in the sense that that ethical relation is ignored in the all, uh, most of the process of social life, right? I don't know. Uh, is it ignored in the process of, of social life? And so it seems that uh, there is something within any collectivity that constructs the oppression 
from the bottom of the society. So I, I, I guess that we have to pay attention to that, uh, to that uh, kind of thing. And so I guess that uh, my question is then, what is, the, within your perspective, what is the um, role of the ethical relations in the sense of the concrete sense given to it by Levitan? What is, uh, could you repeat that, that last part and trying to, uh, what is the? Yeah, yeah, within your perspective. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. So uh, what is the role that the ethical relation mm -hmm. in Levinas, yes. in Levinas' sense, plays? Um, in context of domination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, this is what is, is gets interesting because in a way, Levinas provides, of course, a, a grammar of, of interrelationality. Of the human being needs to be understood primarily as, uh, as a relation. Right? And it's, it's a form of, of, of givenness, it's a form of receptivity. It's basically, um, it's a mode of response, as if responding to a command, as if responding to the command, thou shalt not kill. Right? That's how the human emerges as human being. There is no human without... Uh, somehow, actually, there's not even consciousness. And he says there is no even being as what, uh, for, for instance, Enrique Dussel wrote, there's not even that without there being something that we call human, but that it encounters this something other. And it is the, um, the relation with that other that begins to generate consciousness and symmetry and so on. It generates symmetry because there is not only one other, but there are multiple others, so there is a society. And what he wants to say that in society, society, thought, ideas, everything presupposes a fundamental uh, relation between one and another. But that relationship itself demands to com become something else uh, because there is not only one other. And if you give e all of yourself to one other, you are doing an injustice, you are forgetting a third other. And he says the, the third appears in the face of the other. So immediately you are haunted by the problems of hunting, having to respond ethically to another, but also having to, as it were, distribute what you have so that you, you distribute it among these others. Uh, so when you live in a particular kind of society, um, societies uh, establish their own kind of, of dynamics. Right? And what Levinas would call attention is, I think, talking from uh, a more strictly Levinasian perspective, that somehow... Uh, there is not a, bet a betrayal of the meaning of the human uh, in that process of constitution of a society. For instance, he saw Nazi Germany, and he was a, a survival of uh, he survived the Holocaust, right? Uh, and he 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 was in prison as a, a prisoner of war. So that was, of course, fascism. And Nazism was very much in his mind. And his philosophy is in a way of saying, we cannot develop philosophies such as as fascism or points of views like that. Uh, and think that we are somehow uh, spelling out that this is a natural or a logical consequences of what human beings are, right? So what human beings are is this mode of, of openness and givenness, and what Nazism, Nazism is, is actually the opposite of that, is enclosing subjects in their race and their bodies, right? Because they are superior to others and so on. So there he had, his philosophy could be mobilized against the philosophy of Nazism. And actually one of his first, first essays, I think of 1933, is about the philosophy of Hitlerism, right? So he will be mobilizing his, he will be trying to diagnose what are the philosophical foundations of any given community and begin to problematize that in light of his philosophy. Part of the problem is, though, that he's, uh, he relies only on that fundamental genetical view of the subject, that the subject emerges as in, in a form of ethical relation. But he doesn't have anything else that can tell him in a given situation. Um, where, who is the other in this context? Actually, even when they were asked, literally, well, is in the aren't the Palestinians the privileged other of, of the Jewish population? They say, well, I don't understand, I don't understand alterity in that way. Uh, in a way, the other can be my kin. That is, I can be another Jew. And who attacks the Jew, namely someone like the Palestinian, then becomes not simply another, becomes an enemy. But you see, but when you speak in that way, immediately going from your view about the constitution of subjectivity to speak as about social political matters in this way, 
without an adequate gene genealogy that can understand you, that can provide, can tell you how power works, right? How domination works. Then you you are bound to 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 produce these 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 these, these uh, problems. And in a way, the critique uh, that I do, to, uh, the intervention that I do in Levinas, is not that his philosophy of the other at the genetic level is useful. No, it is. But it is fundamentally incomplete. And if you use it like that from, a, from an Elevinasian point, and it's used to something like what you're asking me, to diagnose any given situation of oppression and so on, you might end up saying something like that. Well, who is the other here? Well, the other is you can end up faulting the oppressed because this is the enemy. This is not the other to whom I owe some responsibility. So you need an understanding, an other, you, you need uh, complementary philosophies about power genealogy about history that he doesn't do. He stays at that level. When he goes to this kind of analysis, easily, when he, that's why when he talks about other people, Asians, immediately, you will think that he would say, well, how, what better than from Europe to encounter the other that is Asia and to put in question some of his presuppositions? No, it is not like that at all. Why? Because he completely uh, begins to operate out of his prejudices Eurocentric prejudices and does not have any kind of substantial analysis that can tell you well how you, how Europe really. I mean, is it true that Europe is just the recipient of this wisdom or what happens with Africa? I mean, he doesn't have to. It's fundamental and complete. That's why when you ask me, he can give you something. Well, he can give you. Uh, it's not something that we can use too much at the concrete level. You need others, and that's what I think that uh, Dussel, for instance, the philosophy of liberation provided a genealogy. A lot of the philosophy of liberation, in addition to the ethical political question that we just saw, is about history and how to understand history. Theorization about the first modernity, the second modernity, dynamics of colonization, which for me are among the most useful things that, 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 that Dussel has produced as a philosopher of history, completely missing Levinas. And that's why I need Fanon, because in Fanon, it's not only a question of, well, who is the other and your enemy? No, let's understand dynamics of subordination and dehumanization. Only by really understanding, Fanon calls them a sociogeny. Only when you do a sociogeny and you understand how the relations of self and others stand in this society, then you can begin to make determinations. Decolonial ethics is an effort to go in this direction, but it will take too long to make that bridge. Um, I'd like to give a, just a, a brief before of my question. Um, I've read Fanon. I've read much of C.L.R. James, really like them both a great deal, and have read them over the years. I've read uh, your book, Against War. In fact, I've read it two or three times, and uh, I've even published a review of it. Um, and so I'm listening to your talk in the context of this. Now, I don't know a lot about many of the other things. I appreciate the sense of complexity, the complexity of the problem that you bring. Always. That can be sort of overwhelming, too. But my question is, um, with that as a basis, you eschew or ignore or leave out of consideration uh, any recourse to Marxism. And it seems to me you also then leave out of consideration <coughs> uh, the category of class and of the economy. Uh, and as a Western Marxist myself, I would say those are pretty fundamental and important to the kind of analysis you want to make even though you don't use them. And the question then is, don't you run the danger in your thought, at what happens actually may be entirely different of course, but don't you run the danger in your thought of simply reproducing um, existing class structures, uh, civil society, and you remember Marx's critique of that in the thesis on Feuerbach, um, of uh, present economic relations and leaving that, that stuff entirely undisturbed. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate you reading the book three times. <laughs> you have read it more than <laughs> myself. <laughs> uh, no, th thanks. No, um, Yes, part of it is not, I mean, capitalism and the economy is, when I talk about coloniality, um, in a way I am th I'm thinking of these issues through the category of coloniality, um, instead of separate as a kind of category that I 
detach from um, the other colonization or racialization, for instance. Um, so one is I would agree that the economy and what we call class is fundamental. I still, I, I still hesitate. I mean, when the the extent to which we can co separate it, and even I'm trying to avoid the you know immediately because there is a discourse, an independent discourse about class out there. Immediately when you go there, um, there is almost the immediate tendency of well, this is this is an arena and discourse and the economy that you can elaborate, and then you can come back to the other issues later. Whereas um, I think that they were in, intimately linked, and I wonder, I even sometimes wonder the extent to which the very um, categories of class, the very category of class, to some extent the economy, to some extent not, as these autonomous categories have, have um, been active participant in promoting the discourse that denies the relevance of colonization, for instance. Because at the end you can think with, with those categories, you, you, you don't. So I think that in a way, one of Quijano's contribution was to say that through coloniality, Yes, I mean, and Quijano would say he's a Marxist. Yeah. Uh, Quijano would say he's a Marxist. C.L.R. James was definitely. Uh, Fanon had a more, uh, another kind of relationship. Uh, whereas, and it's not that he did not consider it important, but he said whenever you read Marx in the colonies, or whenever you want to use Marx in the colonies, you have to pause and you have to make an addition or you have to do something. You cannot just take it like that. I think that he was already in 1961, 1960, pointed to something like Quijano did, like saying, yes, what we need is to bring it together with ideas like colonization and race, and we no longer begin to speak of them as co separate. Um, so that's more the direction where I'm going, that I, complete, I would completely oppose anyone that for, uh, would let go of dynamics of exploitation. Uh, let's put it like that in a general way, dynamics of exploitation. Now, whether I need to understand exploitation through a Marxist concept of class, and class struggle necessarily. I know that, yes, there are some dynamics like that, but it is already crossed through issues of race and in identity. So already when you talked about the, uh, the proletariat, uh, well, can you understand the proletariat without, without these other questions of black, black, or white? And he, Fanon said, well, what happens in the colonies is that they seem to be pretty much the same. That is, uh, like the owners of the means of production, they tend to be white and then the other people. So th there is even complicity there. And that doesn't mean that there are no black people who will, be, who will own the means of production and white people that will be in the periphery. What it means is that probably even to understand that, you have to also bring the concept of race and maybe even a more richer way will be through this notion of coloniality. Um, so uh, Enrique Dussel has written several volumes on Marx. He's still also a, a, a Marxist in that way. Um, I tend to, the, the reason why, and, and I see the, the usefulness in Marx, the reason why I am focusing on more Fanonian categories, that's why it's Fanonian meditations, right? And it doesn't mean that I am, it, it means that I'm taking the approach to Marx like Fanon was taking sort of to Marx. That is, it's there, I use it, but when I'm going to try to understand reality, I let it there and call it when I think that it's useful. Um, and, um, it also comes, comes down to a different understanding of the master-slave relationship in Hegel. Um, because I think that Marx um, um, follows one route that sees right the alienation of the slave, of the worker, through the production of surplus value and takes the, the story from Hegel that the slave can obtain recognition in the product of his work or her work but that is alienated by the, uh, uh, by, by the uh, owner of the means of production. Whereas um, Fanon makes the point that no, the slave is not even asking recognition from the master and is not enjoying any kind of self-recognition with what it produces. Uh, the slave goes um, uh, to cut the head of the, of the master. There, there is another, and, and we can of course uh, have a discussion about that. But I think that definitely there is a, a different kind of intervention when it comes to understanding that relation of domination between master and slave. And thus one route takes more centrally to class and to the questions of exploitation and the extraction of surplus value. Another takes more to um, a, a confrontation of more like the actual slaves with the actual masters. 
than with a worker with an owner of the means of production. So that's why I am trying to explore this other one, but not forgetting that the problems, that the other problems are also real. Um, so I take it also as a challenge, and thank you for bringing it up. There, there's a question out here out front. Uh, Rocio has a question. Had a question for a while. Can, can I get on the queue? Uh, Who has the queue? Jose, he has the queue. Coming down this way. Okay. Okay, so th thank you so much, Nelson, for your, for your wonderful presentation. I, I'm curious because I was um, um, very interested in your um, – kind of calling into question the spatial imaginary of the continent. And I wanted to hear more about what you imagine that for a thinking coming from the Caribbean in particular, you know, if, you would, if, if um, you would elaborate it in terms of, for example, the idea of the Confederation of the Antilla, La Confederación Antillana, and the whole idea of, right, kind of, so, so what, if you could elaborate what would, um, a thinking from the Caribbean be as opposed to a co imaginary construction of the continent. And, and, you know, if I could add to that, how would, you know, if we would think about thinking from the Caribbean with this, this kind of idea from the dancers, from Nelson, from this other people, thinking about it as a confederation of, of something like you know, um, uh, the cultural similarities between Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, Republic, Republic of Dominican and Haiti, um, if, if, it's, if, it, if you could expand, what would that mean for today's predicament, the types of ambivalences that it might um, kind of recall insofar as we now, we live in a kind of this heightened globalized, not a new globalized um, context, but certainly kind of a perilous neoliberal globalized. Well, it is interesting. I, in a way, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. I did my bachelor's degree there. But it was not really until I came to the United States where I really felt, I think, what it was to be Caribbean. Um, I sort of live it, but I would not understand it or qualify it like that. And it makes a difference. Uh, for the very experience itself, how you see the experience. How you see the experience affects the very experience. <laughs> uh, so, and it was in part because in the island, and, and I don't think it's only inclusive of Puerto Rico, it's also true of other, other islands, other, other parts of the region. That, uh, but in Puerto Rico, for instance, and I think it's part of the Hispanic Caribbean, there is, a, a, there is already a discourse of many Caribbean intellectuals being linked with the Latin American liberation processes, and thus the Hispanic Caribbean as part of Latin America. So in a way, sometimes you find the more continental discourse that you belong to uh, the, the continent, in part because the, the Span Spanish, right, it was part of the kingdom of Spain, and New Spain, and the, the, you know, there was the main parts of the kingdom were in Mexico, in Colombia, and so on, so it was part of that territory. So still, the idea that you are, you are and it's a colonial legacy, right? You are, you, your self-identity is more directed to see yourself as part of this larger. So there is a continental Latin American uh, train. But the other part is the influence from the United States. Because, and because since the last almost 100 years, has been, the United States has been influencing education in the island so much that, that in schools, I mean, to the extent that there was an, an effort to have all Puerto Ricans change their language from Spanish to English, which of course was a failure, but it was an attempt that tells you the extent to which we still today, when we go to school, the narratives that we receive of how we see ourselves is, well, Latin America is here and the United States is here. And there are these other islands with black people around, a lot of black people. Are, I mean, that's why there's, the, and you don't want to be Haiti, that certainly, and these other people, the Jamaicans, we don't even know about them. Now, the interesting thing is when you are in the States, and this happens actually to many populations from the Caribbean, that they get the realization of their Caribbeanity when they go out to the metropolis, right? Uh, because they meet other people from those other regions. And uh, actually, one of the experiences I had it was I was entering into a class, and there was a film where um, Joby Fanon, the brother of Franz Fanon, is speaking in the film. I come late to the class for a good minute or something. 
I thought that this was a Puerto Rican person speaking Spanish, and I was just not focusing on understanding the meaning because I was preparing in my desk and so on. When I paid attention, I say, this is not Spanish. This is French or Creole. But then I say, wow. But the rhythm, everything was like I was hearing someone speaking Spanish, but it was talking. You know? And then you begin to realize, well, it is like the, the grammar through this difference, linguistic and cultural difference, there are some elements. I am convinced that is the African presence in the Caribbean, right? And I'm saying this because this is part of the challenge to, first, to the discourse of continentality also, but also to the discourse of generating something larger, like a Caribbean confederation. Now, um, what do you do, right? I think that part of the challenge that we have is create institutions and affect the, the education, right, the school, the cultures, so that we don't have to go out and depend on contingent events to let us know how similar we can be, right, or how many interests we can have in common. So we need to do a lot of work in the region before we get to anything like a potential for something more uni uh, uh, united. Um, and uh, what can we concretely do? Well, the Caribbean Philosophical Association, one thing that we do that does not follow the model of continentality, right, but I think follows something else, which is another part of your question. I was telling you before that what, how, what we pay most attention in the conference is not so much having, okay, the Caribbean Philosophical Association is about people who do Caribbean philosophy. First, it's not only philosophy. There are people who do theories in, in many, other, many departments. Second, it's not only Caribbean people, because we understand the Caribbean as related to what it, what it means to be considered <laughs> like Caliban in the modern world. So the Caribbean is everywhere. So everywhere, yeah, this is a space for everyone who has an experience of being Caliban in some way or who studies those kind of issues, you are part of this community, come. So this is a global Caribbeanity. And, and then it's not by region or anything that we center. We try to have artists, activists, and intellectuals in multiple fields. That is the community of the Caribbean Philosophical Association. right? So in a way, that very structure and way of calling people, try to put people together, is hopefully trying to maintain, foster that kind of interrelationality of coming together, of sharing ideas that could perhaps in the future hopefully serve as something that helps the idea of a post-continental Caribbean confederation or something like that. We have very strict time limits and it's about, we have about 10 or 15. Should we just have the panelists maybe if they have questions for Nelson? We can move to that section. So start with. No, it's okay. No, let 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 the no, let, let the, the audience. Yeah, yeah. I will respond at the end, so everybody could could talk, and I will yeah. just say one minute to respond to everything, uh, and then we'll we say, can. We'll say. You can treat me a beer later. About fifteen yeah. minutes. So <coughs> at, at, at the <coughs> Why don't you take well, two? We, we do have fifteen minutes. Why don't you take two questions? Uh, <coughs> two small <coughs> observations. I agree with you what you say. The philosophy of liberation in the beginning uh, didn't took the problem of race that I think is good. We discovered in the 70s that because in the 60s uh, the problem was not very present. I remember in 75 a dialogue with Jace Cohn the first time in Detroit and I discovered the problem of race. And Aníbal began to work the question of race in the 80s because it's the moment where uh, the Marxism opened the eyes to the new problems, and he discovered the question of race, so original and so interesting. One observation. And the second two is the question of politics in Levinas, yes. We see the problem in this question very quickly, and exactly one of you give me now this uh, book of Orovitz, Difficult Justice, and <laughs> there is an article of me on the problem of the Zionism mm. in Levinas mm. and uh, the impossibility for him to understand the question, for example, of the Palestinian. <coughs> but not only the other as Palestinian, but the politics as such. Levinas has many problems. It's to say that many times we use these authors, like Heidegger and others, but not means that we are disciples that must uh, repeat all the doctrine of the philosophers, but they give us uh, inspiration for an, some aspect 
in another question, we are absolutely in a different position. No? Sir. I, when am I going to be able to say something? Let, let him, yeah, before he, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're now the other. <laughs> <laughs> My family uh, comes from Jamaica, and my mother and father are immigrants to uh, New York and Jamaica. They're the Enriquez family, as well as <coughs> uh, the Matalans. They came from, one came from Syria, and the others came from uh, Portugal very, very early, about in 1540-something like that. My question is, I don't think they have gotten that far when you talking about, as, the, as far as the, the progressive, I'm not talking about the, their, their environments or, or something like that, but they, they don't seem to get to this next step. <coughs> and I'm wondering maybe you, if you could help me uh, to understand that. They, they, they don't want to get to that next step. And um, there's been hurricanes in that little island. Uh, but it's a very beautiful place. And I just wondered if I could hear some comments from you about Jamaica. Um, let me begin with, with that one since it's very fr it's fresh in our, in our minds. You're saying that you're asking me um, what do I think about people in Jamaica right now yeah. that they don't seem to get to a point of of how would you characterize that they are that that uh, they are provincial or do not have a pan Caribbean perspective and are not dealing with issues about injustice and ethics in the Car that kind of thing yeah. that is get it um, well. <laughs> that's the attitude. That's right there. That's the attitude. Right? <laughs> you, you offer yourself. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we can call to the travel agency. I'm sure that there are a number of flights going to Jamaica uh, in the next uh, few hours. Uh, well, you know, it's, first I would say whatever problems J Jamaica ha have that you're thinking probably are not unique to, <laughs> to Jamaica, and probably a lot of them have to do with the very history of colonialism and the legacy of colonialism in the region. That is, the Caribbean is an area that was devastated by empires, com genocides taking riches away, and then left right out there on, their, on their devices for the most part of the little resources. So uh, sometimes when you put it that way, it's like, well, what else do you expect anyway? Um, and much more has been done than actually could have been done, I think, rationally, given the resources and the situation that Caribbean people were facing, right? Uh, living uh, in context that, I mean, of massive systematic slavery, a plantation system, and, uh, and, and still, you know, survive, have a notion of a community that can contribute to the world. Uh, you contribute to a number of intellectual and artists, um, perhaps the best known, I don't know, maybe even artists in the, in the entire um, continent uh, come from <laughs> Jamaica, is Bob Marley. Uh, and it's uh, an ethics and politics of decolonization through Rastafarianism. So I would say Jamaica, when you go to Brazil, actually, you cannot go to, El Sa to Salvador, Brazil, without seeing the Jamaican flags all around, because many of the Afro-Brazilians identify themselves with Jamaica, so they will tell you right there, what are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about? Jamaica is, is one of the, po through those voices, right? So on the one hand, part of what the condition has to do with the situation of geopolitical, you know, colonization, exploitation. Then there is another thing that is called the United States that is a little bit up to the north and all the dynamics that have to do with, with that relation. Um, so, so again, many, you know, I think that, that, that you will discover probably much more than what you see. And when, what, when you see what you see, when you look carefully at what you see, you will see that it's not some problem with Jamaicans that are not doing something. Um, it's a result of a number of, of elements and, and factors. But uh, you are right, uh, ending with the question of, the question is, what can we do, seriously, um, uh, to respond to this? I am saying that a number of 
us working in the Caribbean Philosophical Association, intervening how we can. We go to the Caribbean, we try to, uh, this conference takes place in the United States, but also in the Caribbean. Went to Colombia last, last year, next year we're going to Trinidad, we have been in Guadalupe, we have been in Jamaica twice. Actually, the Caribbean Philosophical Association was born in Jamaica, so that's another little good product coming out of the island. Uh, so I, I like that, right? That's, uh, so you can become a member if you want, you know, that's always be a step. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, in Enrique, yes, race uh, and the conversation with James Cohn. But, but, but I think that, y I think that, you, that you know, and because I know, and, and I think you have published it, if not, we have talked about it, and James Cohn has published it, that the results of out of that conversation, where you are saying now that you discover race, is that if you ask Cohn and the, uh, 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 the African-American theologians, they still say to this day, they didn't understand anything. There were these Latin American elite theologians that were coming here thinking what was liberation, and we were talking, they, they saw us, and I think this is the interpretation that the Latin American had of them. They don't realize that they live in the United States, and they are at the center of the empire. So all the reports, right, like Latin Americans, coming to the dialogue and go, living with the conclusion that these people, they don't realize the problem of class, and they don't realize the problem of imperialism, the problem that comes with the fact that they are in the United States. For the African Americans, when they look at the Latin Americans, is you're coming from the South and you're talking about the third world, but you don't even, you don't, you cannot see the problem of blackness here, and even less where you're coming from. So uh, I think it was a, that event was of, according to what I have read, and I think we have to, it was a massive misencounter. So I don't know if it translated to an actual, let's say, an impact, a substantial impact in the philosophy of liberation, where race would now be really integrated as a category. So I think that it, it, was, it was early, it happened, it was a moment, but I'm not sure. I mean, we can have a conversation about it. And it's not like, I mean, a philosophy of liberation contributes in so much other angles. What I'm saying, in respect to that question, I think that in part because the continued dialogical partners before and after it have been European intellectuals that do not deal with race. Right, that is. Uh, I don't think that in your work one has seen a substantive, sustained engagement with the James Cones of this world or with other people doing race. I think the engagement has continued to be with the Habermases and the Apples and the problems they have. And race for them is not central. So as a result, of, as part of the conversation, this happens similarly with gender. I think as a result, since you, you are responding critically to these European philosophers, there are creative and ingenious responses and counter responses but there are certain themes that other subaltern philosophers are thinking about that doesn't make it to that conversation. There could be an encounter, but doesn't make it into the regis registry. And, uh, uh, and even with that, uh, what you have produced and philosophy of liberation is immensely helpful. And there's no thinking that can do it all anyway. So, uh, so I say a lot of things at the same time uh, with the greatest respect. And uh, the inspiration, you say something about the inspiration. Oh yes, Levinas, the completely. Uh, you d are not simply a, an interpreter of Levinas. You are a creative thinker and develop things that Levinas did not even think about. We, we have time for one more short question, Eduardo. Oh, it's not short then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well. I want to, s I, <laughs> I raised a hand years ago. Oh. But it's okay. Nelson has covered so much of what I wanted to say that Eduardo can speak. How about that? Well. How about we say, thank you, Nelson, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I can, I can, um, I'm going to incorporate you.